Hello, denizens of the internet. Now, usually I do a yearly update video on my Hackintosh, but I had just switched to a Ryzen 3950X Hackintosh, just sort of right on that deadline. And, and it's been an interesting learning curve. So I thought I would give you my initial impressions using a Ryzen Tosh as a daily driver and switching to open core from Clover bootloader. Stay tuned. <laughs> this presentation will cover the following. What has it been like and would I recommend an AMD Hackintosh over an Intel Hackintosh over a Mac? Then I'll show you in the most rudimentary fashion some differences between Clover and OpenCore, the bootloaders that made this whole Hackintoshing thing magical sometimes. I'll show you briefly how I update from one version of OpenCore to another, at least the way I do it. And finally, I will show you how I solved my Logic Pro 10 playback problem that I first described in my Music Tosh video. Again, I'm not going to show you how specifically to do anything. I'm just taking you on my personal journey of Hackintosh discovery. What has it been like using an AMD Hackintosh as a working rig? I think in year one, my year one Hackintosh video, I said, well, it didn't give me any problems and didn't crash any more frequently than a real Mac. There was this nagging fear that it would just pack it all in suddenly and then, then that would be the end of that. My first Hackintosh was built using an Intel i7-4790K. By year two, I had, an, I had upgraded to an i7-7700K and my fears of sudden meltdown were gone and it had become a great, reliable computer. Now, suddenly, I did a double switcheroo going AMD Ryzen, ditching Clover and embracing OpenCore. You have to understand that up until fairly recently, an AMD Hackintosh was a much more dodgy enterprise and OpenCore was something I looked at from afar because I was afraid of it. But the combination of Clover support ending on AMD and me being stuck with this 3950X, I had no choice but to learn OpenCore. Now learn is probably the wrong word because I haven't come close to mastering OpenCore, and that kind of nagging fear that I had in year one of Hackintoshing has kind of returned, mainly because OpenCore is an unforgiving master. Clover is your drunken bootloader. You can do a lot of stupid things with it, and it will still sort of work most of the time. Mastering OpenCore requires the dedication of a Buddhist monk, and one wrong AML file or get two kecks out of order and nothing will work. OpenCore is harsh, but the Zen of OpenCore and its austerity has grown on me. As far as computing experience is concerned, everything works on my AMD box except for sleep. And at the end of this painfully long video, I will show you how I got Logic Pro benchmark really cooking on all 125 channels. I can't recall any Mac software that would not run on my Intel Hackintoshes, whereas I've found a few things that won't run on AMD. There has been the odd crash, that has just come out of the blue. I think if you're worried about full Mac compatibility, stick with Intel. My biggest disappointment with my Ryzen Tosh is that the bloody thing has a 16 core, 32 thread CPU that uh, when pushed will boost to 4.2 gigahertz across all cores. It will run again when pushed to 60 degrees Celsius and pulls only 109 watts. And most likely uh, I will never have to buy another computer again for the rest of my life. This thing is a beast. It makes me so sad. And as far as comparisons to Macs, I got into this game because Apple was not making any Mac that fit my needs. Well, now they do. But while my 2006 Mac Pro cost me about 6,000 Canadian dollars, my Ryzen Tosh was $10,000 cheaper than a comparable 2019 Mac Pro. Way too large a delta to shrug off and ignore. Now, over to Peter Paul Chato for the super geeky stuff. Take it away, Peter Paul. Thank you very much, Paul, for that wonderful intro. Uh, here I am, as you can see, stuck. I'm trapped in my, in my OBS uh, video window. Uh, this is the first time I'm using OBS, so be gentle with your comments, because this is going to be a rambling mess of a video. Over here, you can see I've got my browser. 
And down there, you can see my folder of, of stuff, which I will be accessing. My goal here is to just give you the briefest of overview of some of the differences between Open Core and Clover Bootloader, uh, and to show you uh, how I update Open Core. That's really my entire goal with this particular segment of this video. So if you want to know more about Open Core, and how to start building a Hackintosh using OpenCore, then you go to the OpenCore desktop guide. One of the nice things about OpenCore is things are a little bit more centralized, a little less all over the place comp compared to Clover uh, Bootloader. So if you're going to start with an OpenCore Hackintosh, then the only place to go to is with the OpenCore desktop guide. I will leave a link uh, below. Now, you can use this guide to build uh, uh, Intel-based, Hackintoshes or AMD based Hackintoshes. If you're just interested in in uh, Clover, then feel free to you know go to the Hackintosh Vanilla Desktop Guide. Uh, it's a very good start to how to build a um, a Hackintosh using the Clover bootloader. Uh, now, there's an awful lot of prepackaged Clover bootloaders. Um, I would still recommend that you go here first and learn the intricacies of a uh, of, of vanilla install because number one, I think you'll appreciate what's going on. Uh, number two, if your prepackaged uh, Clover install isn't working, then you'll have uh, maybe a bit more skills and knowledge to triage it. Plus, if you're asking a question in the help forums, uh, your questions will be, well, they'll sound more knowledgeable and they'll be more respectful of the people who are helping you because the they get way too many questions from people that sounds like, uh, I got an IBM AS400, is it Hackintoshable? I don't know, maybe, maybe it is. Anyways, you gotta be nice to the people who are trying to help you on the Hackintosh discords and, and other forums. And you do that by asking questions that show that you've actually done a little bit of research ahead of time. They really appreciate that. So let's let's move on. The other big difference between Clover Bootloader and OpenCore is the configurator. Now, both of them uh, use a config.plist. The difference is that if you opened up, uh, well, let's open up um, right here. I'm going to open up my old machine, my i7-7700K config.plist using Clover. Uh, I'm then going to open my Ryzen config.plist with uh, plist editor pro. Uh, I recommend that you use this. Now, this is pretty, but if you open a config.plist made for open core using the Clover configurator, you will blow it up. So don't do that. So immediately you can see that this is got all sorts of switches and buttons and things to, to press. And this looks like a nunnery. It is really, it's quite stark. I was um, intimidated by this at the very beginning, but I've learned to really appreciate its simplicity. Clover Bootloader does a whole bunch of things automatically. Pretty much everything is manual uh, on Open Core. Automatic things include. Uh, well, I mean, let's say I go to kernel and patches. Uh, you can get a whole list of patches here, as you can see in Clover. Th this is good for legacy OS and legacy hardware, but it can also get you into a lot of trouble if you don't know what you're doing and you're just dropping all sorts of weird-ass patches here um, that you have no idea what's going on because you're thrashing. So... Clover, unfortunately, does encourage thrashing if you don't know what you're doing. The other thing that it does is, well, it injects kexts automatically. One of the big things with OpenCore right now and plist editor is that nothing is automatic. If I wanted to change my, update my kexts, I go to my kernel here, click on the add block, 
And then I've got all my texts here. One of the good things about Open Core and PList Editor is that it demands that you do some of them in the right order. So for instance, Lilu text has to be at the very beginning, has to be first loaded, loaded first, and virtual SMC kext has to be second. With Clover, I'm not entirely certain whether you can force kext order, but in open core, some things just have to be in the right order. And these two have to be first and second, and then you can kind of put the other kext in any order that you want, except for exceptions, like you've installed a Broadcom Bluetooth Wi-Fi chip, replace the Intel one on your motherboard, uh, if you install the Broadcom kext, and maybe you'll need up to three of them to make it work, depending on your chip, you, those have to be in the right order or the chip won't work. And in, in an even worse case scenario, I wanted to get uh, my, my AMD power gadget working. Uh, it requires two kexts. I happen to get them in the wrong order and my computer wouldn't even start. So I made the mistake of not reading the instructions for the kext. So when I flip them around here in the right order, so for instance, the AMD Ryzen CPU power management management kext has to be before the SMC AMD processor dot kext. And if you get them in the right order, then your computer will boot and you get this lovely gadget that you can, you can play with. But if you get them in the wrong order, not only will this not load, uh, your computer won't load. So this is the fun world of hackintoshing kids. Again, like I've always said, it's not for the faint of heart. Now, when you're updating open core, uh, you have to use this because you're going to be comparing files. Uh, in the case of uh, Clover configurator, for the most part, all you have to do is update. Uh, we, well, let's go back here. You just update your Clover bootloader update your texts, and you're pretty much done. You never really have to touch uh, Clover Configurator. But in the case of, of OpenCore, uh, you're going to be doing all sorts of stuff. So for instance, uh, 5.8 is the most recent release. You would go to the docs, you would double click on your, your differences manual, and then you would go through and check to see what the differences are from previous config.plist. You can see in blue here, this is an update, this is a change, this is a change, and all these things have to be, for the most part, updated in your config.plist. And you'd have to update them here. Now they make it a little bit easier by having a sample plist. But then how do you compare your sample plist with your config plist that you're actually running? Very simple. You use a tool. I'm using a tool called diff merge. And so I will load my sample plist. And just for the sake of this discussion, so you'll see some really big differences. I'm going to load a very early config.plist right here. This is from 5.6, I believe. And here's my sample list. Here's my live one. Now this, you don't necessarily have to fully trust and just copy this stuff. I can just click on this and have it move in a, uh, over to this side of the ledger. But this is what I would do to check to see what the differences are between what is the new proper config.plist with my config.plist and what needs to be updated. Uh, another really handy tool, making sure that your config.plist is up to date and, and proper is using Sanity Checker. So if I use my old config.plist and I want to see what needs to be changed. So let's pretend it's this is a 5.8. I've now built my 5.8 config.plist. This is now telling me, oh, my UFI AP, APFS section is missing. Uh, these things are yellow. So I, I should check to see whether I need to attend to them. This is red. I need to change this. And all these changes are happening here. Bootloader, this stuff here corresponds to these items here and I have to go in and change them 
manually or or add them if they're if they're missing. So I, and I would use my sample p list because they have to be in the right format. So once I go through this and I can get them all to be green, so I'll go back most recent config.p list and run it through sanity checker. I got a couple things at the top here which are meaningless, but you can see that they're all green, which means that your computer will probably boot. So while open core is more difficult to, to set up, you've got tools like this that will at least make sure that you've got it set up correctly. A very, very different experience, less automated. I'm actually really enjoying it. So back to you, Paul. Did you get all that? Finally, the mystery of the Logic Pro benchmark test solved. You might remember in my Music Tosh uh, video where I built a Thunderbolt-enabled i9-9900K system for Logic Pro music production that could scream through the 125-track Logic Pro benchmark test. But my sad Ryzen Tosh could only you know, muster 20 sad tracks before cacking. I shall demonstrate. While this was not a problem with the way I was using Logic day-to-day, -day, it did really bug me. I noticed during the higher track test that it looked like Logic was running out of threads. I thought there might be a conflict with clock speed and Logic's thread management, so I figured that if I lowered the clock speed on the processor that Logic could better manage the threads. Coming to the rescue was AMD Power Gadget. I was able to use it and select the power tool option and clicking on the 2.7 gigahertz, I could play all 125 tracks without breaking a sweat. Why exactly this worked, I can't tell you. I, I did have the thread count uh, in Logic Preferences set to 32 and I didn't want the buffer size to be above 128, but it did work at 64 also. Obviously my system has its issues with Logic Pro. Your mileage may vary. And as always happens, some wonderful smart person out there will go, hey, Peter Paul, you're missing the Logic Pro Fix AML. I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> anyway, so thank you for watching, Denizens. Oh, sorry. Th th this is the time in the video where uh, Wancho usually interrupts me. Where is he? Oh, <sighs> this video was so long that he's actually curled up asleep in the dog's cage. <laughs> oh, he looks, looks so cute. Oh, you should see him. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, Dennis, till next time. So long.